Satan clip. Uh, so I, I really want to lay hands on you all. You realize that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I think I'm going to do it afterwards. <laughs> We've, we've got, look, you're my life group, okay? And um, I, I want to do life with you, uh, not because I'm trying to start a church. I make a good preacher a horrible pastor. Um, you know, you need, you need, you need to uh, be a little more gentler with people. And uh, for me, I, 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 I'm like the truth girl, like get yourself together. And you can't be a pastor and say, get yourself together, right? But I, I, I believe that tonight, I have in my midst some movers and shakers and history makers. Yeah. And I'm not just saying it to um, appease you or to placate you. I'm saying it because honestly, this is going to be a, 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 a destiny defining moment for you. Tonight, your destinies change. Yeah. And they're changing permanently. You, 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 you expended the energy because you wanted something more. Yeah. So let's go for the more. Amen. Amen. Let's just go for it. Pull all the stops out. Give me an opportunity to do life with you this year and watch how your life will be transformed. Yeah. I, I, the same truth that I'm teaching, I have to apply it to my own life. One of the things I cannot do is apply it to your life. When you walk out of here, all those notes that you're taking, I want you to choose one, at least one principle and make an immediate application. Promise me. Amen. Say, I promise you. I promise you. Make immediate, and we're going to do that every, every time that we're together. We're together every two weeks. We're going, I'm going to challenge you to pick one principle and make application. And when you come in, Pastor Ryan is going to ask you, how did you make that application? Is that all right? Yes. So we're going to hold you accountable for moving from where you are. Life doesn't have to be like it is. It's just boring to do the same thing over and over and over yeah. again. Let's get the excitement back into your life. Amen. 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 Let's get it back. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, let's go to a particular text from out of 1 Corinthians 13 and 11. 1 Corinthians 13 and 11. How many of you love the Word of God? Amen. Amen. The Word of God is alive. It's quick and powerful. It's not dead. It's actually doing every time the Word of God is preached, every time you read the Word of God, every time you study the Word of God, every time you decree the Word of God, every time you pray the Word of God, something is being transformed yeah. and it's being transformed at the speed of light. Light travels 156,000 miles per second, I think it is, and it travels really, really fast. And something is happening in your life, around your life. Something is happening in your community, your ministry. Something is happening as soon as the Word of God is released. And so even as we are now studying the Word of God and we're excavating the Word of God for the truth, we're digging deep, we're taking deep dives, we're not doing a shadow uh, a, a shallow kind of Bible study. We're doing a deep dive so that we can pull out the nuggets and make application. Every time the Word of God is released, something is altered in your life. If you believe it, shout, I believe you. I believe it. So out of the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 13 of course being the love chapter, the scripture says, Paul, he said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. Yeah. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I didn't pray aside. I put aside the childish things. There comes a time in your life when you have to say, this is not working for me anymore. Let me pick up a different strategy. Let me learn a different strategy. Let me get a different tool. Do the same, get the same. Do different, get different. And we're talking about you growing up, you maturing in the things of the Lord. Paul said, I understood that I had to cooperate, but I also had to contribute. I had to contribute to my own maturity. When it comes to maturation, nobody's going to mature you for you. You have to not only contribute to your own maturity, you've got to co cooperate with the process of growth. So the litmus test of maturity is stated right here. It's based on three things, your speech, your understanding, and your thinking. If you are speaking the same way you spoke last year, the year before, about your life, about things, about situations, that means there's no growth. 
If you, if, if you, you are, uh, are understanding things the same way that you have not been challenged, that to, to maybe I'm looking at things differently or wrongly, or maybe my perception needs to be adjusted. If you, your understanding is exactly like it was five years ago, two years ago, last year, you have not grown. And then if you're thinking the same way, if you're thinking about life the same way, if you're thinking about the devil the same way, if you're thinking about this world the same way, if you're thinking about your finances, your relationship, your marriage, your husband, your children, if your thoughts have not changed, you have not grown, you have not matured. That is the litmus test. You've gotta be able to catch yourself thinking and speaking and understanding. Catch yourself. And if your, your words and your understanding and your thoughts and your speech is not in alignment with the word of God, you've got to go back and ask the question, what have I been thinking about? What have I been speaking uh, you, you know, about? How have I been speaking about my life? If those things haven't changed, you have not grown. If you are speaking and understanding and thinking like you did last year, you have not grown. There is no growth. When it comes to spiritual maturation, there are eight stages of growth in spiritual maturation before you are able to, number one, access your spiritual inheritance. Nobody is going to give you access to an inheritance that you're going to waste. It's like the prodigal son. He was immature and, 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 and he wanted his inheritance. His father didn't give him his inheritance, but his father allowed him to go out there to test his understanding of who he was and what he had in his father's house. He wasn't rebellious. He was immature. And his father, there were some things that you got to learn on your own. Those of you that have, uh, have parented children, you know, they, they, they know it all when they're teenagers, right? And, and, and you don't know anything. You know, firstly, when they're growing up, you're their hero. And then when they become a teenager, you're their enemy. And then, you know, there comes a point where as we mature and we look back and you say, you know, my mother wasn't crazy after all, <laughs> you know, or my father wasn't crazy after all. They had some wisdom. And what, what, what maturity gives you is wisdom. And so when you begin to talk about God giving you your inheritance and giving you access to your inheritance, that, uh, there's another portion of that. And that's the portion where God then gives you the honor to become a spiritual mother and a spiritual father. There's, there's, there's nothing like having a matured uh, spiritual covering. A person who is demonstrating uh, what, it, what it's like to be like, like Jesus and act like Jesus and talk like Jesus. And I'm talking about not just spiritually, not just in the church, in all areas of their lives where there is fruitfulness. There is the fruit that proves their maturity. They're fruitful in all areas. You could peel back the layers of their personal life. You could peel back their layers of their professional life. And what you will get is maturity. And so what God wants to do is to mature you so that you're able now to raise other spiritual sons and daughters. Today, the world is, is in, in, in a crisis because you have so many young people having, having children and, and their children themselves. So, you know, the problem is not with single parent having children. The problem is with children having children. Right. We're, we're, we're now, uh, they need to be parented. And as it is in the natural, so it is in the spiritual. There are so many people that are gifted and are talented, but they should not be spiritual parents to anybody right. because they themselves have not grown up in the things of the Lord. And so what God wants to do is to mature us as sons and daughters and to give us access to our inheritance. And then legally, we can reproduce as spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers. And so there are eight stages of spiritual maturation. Each stage has a particular level of authority.
And so stage one, you have a particular level of authority. Stage two, there's another level of authority. Stage three, there's another level. Stage four and stage five. What we want to do in this series is not only look at the stages of spiritual maturation, but also discern what level of authority. Now, this message really is not for you to figure out your neighbor's level of spiritual maturity. It's for you to identify what stage of maturity you are at. This is not a series where now you sit up and you try to figure out your pastors or your spiritual leaders. This is not for anybody else but you. And, you know, each one of those stages has a specific level of authority which you have to learn about. You remember the sons of Sceva that is talked about in the book of Acts where Paul, a mature, seasoned apostle, goes into a region and he is commending demons and devils. And so the sons of Sceva decides, well, we're going to, you know, we're anointed like Paul. So we're going to rebuke these demons. And what did they do? They stripped them. So what happened in the natural was an indication of what was going in the spirit. Why did they strip them of their clothing? It is because they were sons, but they were not submitted. So it's possible for you to be associated, but you have no submission. And we're not talking about someone controlling your life because submission has, has little to do with activities and more to do with an attitude. I'm fully submitted to my spiritual leader, my pastor. My pastor is Dr. Bill Winston. Um, and of course, I live in one state and my church is in another state. So how often do I go to church? Not very often. <laughs> Why? Because I'm called into full-time ministry. But am I submitted? Absolutely. I'm submitted. If he says, you got to come off the road, I'm going to come off the road. Why? Because it's not in an action. Just because you're in a physical building doesn't mean that you're under a spiritual covering. You, 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 there's a lot of accountability that is there and there's a lot of trust. So how do I get fed? I'm mature enough to tune in. Are you with me? He doesn't have to say, did you tune in? Why? Because technology allows me to go to church. And then he doesn't have to ask me, did you pay your tithes? Did you give a first fruit? You know, are you uh, uh, supporting the ministry? He doesn't have to call me up to do that. Why? I do it because why? I matured. I matured. I'm not submitted to him for him to pay my bills. This is the mistake that a lot of young ministers make. They associate with a person so a person can make decisions for them, pay their bills. He's my covering. A covering is like a roof. And so when a roof needs to be repaired, guess what? I own a house. And so when the roof needs to be repaired, uh, the roof doesn't fix itself. I have to pour the money into what? keeping the roof in a state of good repair. And so when you have a covering, it is imperative that you give up because you want them to stay in a state of good repair financially and spiritually. I don't need him worried about how he's going to pay a bill. I need him to be up, getting up, and getting up in the realm of the spirit and getting a word for me. Are you with me? When you're matured, you take care of your covering. There's a difference between a covering and a pastor. Are you with me? And someone that is your uh, uh, prayer general. All of them, you know, we, we can make a different demand. There's a difference in having a spiritual father. And, and just because a person is your pastor doesn't mean that they're, that they're your spiritual father. And just because they're your, your spiritual father, it don't mean that they're your covering. It's all about submission. And a lot of people sit in church and they get upset. And, and, and even for young pastors, too. With young pastors, you got to understand, everybody in your pew is not your uh, spiritual son. Right. You're, some people are sitting there as uh, at their, your, you're their pastor, but they may not be your spiritual son. Right. So your sons and daughters are going to have your DNA. Are you with me? So you may pastor them, 
but that you may not father them. It's possible. So you so that you're not disappointed in ministry when you begin to minister. I pastored for 15 years. I had to understand there were some people that were there. They wanted me to mentor them. So usually if you're a mentor of a person, you mentor them at a distance. If you coach a person, you coach them close up. I'm also an a, 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 a intercessor. I pray. And so there are some people that follow me. They follow me like a soldier follows a general. So those types of people, they're, I, I'm not going to treat them as if they're my sons. Are you with me? Or my daughter. Because they may not carry my DNA, but they may just be a part of my battalion. Are you following me? This is spiritual maturity. And so you treat sons and daughters different than what you treat a soldier. A soldier, they don't have an option. Sons and daughters, when they get rebellion, you don't kick them out of the house. You bring a man, you smack him. Are you with me? But, but, but try to smack somebody that you're mentoring. You, you're going to have a, 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 a legal suit on your hand for battery. Are you with me? And so you've got to understand who are these people that, that God is commissioning me to influence and to affect and impact. And this takes spiritual maturation. People that have my DNA, I know and they know. People that don't have my DNA, I know and they know. <laughs> so I, I see so many young pastors, they call everybody their sons and daughters. You, you understand when you say son and daughter, you are responsible for providing their inheritance. So be careful who you call son and who you call daughter. Because if you have a hundred of them, a thousand of them, that means you better have a big pocketbook, a big bank account. Because you are responsible for them financially. Are you you got to leave a legacy for your sons and daughters. I don't call a whole bunch, bunch of people sons and daughters. Why? Because now I got to pay some bills. <laughs> have you ever seen grown children? Once they go out of the house, what happens? They come back with what? Grandchildren. <laughs> so you think you're finishing, <laughs> you finished up your financial uh, responsibility and you've discharged all of your uh, responsibility? No, they come back with grandchildren. And then you fall in love a little bit more with grandchildren. And then not only do your sons and daughters spend your retirement money, now you got little rugrats running around. And you say, oh, they're, those, they're so cute. And are you with me? And what you didn't do with your sons and daughters, you do it with what? Your grandchildren. So you're never financially uh, 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 finished. When it comes to sons and daughters, because you've got grandchildren and great grandchildren and so on and so forth. So spiritual maturation is important because you need to be able to identify the types of relationships, the nature of your relationship. You not only have to understand, but the people that you're relating with, they have to understand as well so that you are manage managing expectations. Are you with me? You manage expectations. People have natural, natural family, but they also have spiritual family. But your spiritual family is not there to pay your rent and your car note. Right. That's what your natural family is there for. And there are so many people that are suffering from church hurt because they misunderstand what it means to be a sister in the Lord and a brother in the Lord. And we are setting one another up. You have set yourself up to be hurt. Are you with me? We set ourselves up. After all I did for the church, I paid my tithe, I paid my offering. The church is not a bank. So we're, we need to grow up. Turn to your neighbor and say, grow up. Grow up. So th this takes, we, we really have to work through this. We have to work through, if I'm at this stage, what, what level of authority do I have in the realm of the spirit? Yeah. You don't want to be like the sons of Sceva. You're anointed, but you're not in the realm. You're anointed, but you don't have the mantle. Yeah. And so they came, you know, in the name of Paul. I cast you out. And, and the demon said, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. But you're not registered in this realm. You are out of.
out of your leg. Bam, there it is. Why? Because you move from out of covering. This is spiritual. Listen to me carefully. This is not to make you um, uh, afraid, but it's to bring awareness. The realm of the spirit, that's what we're talking about, spiritual. We're not talking about natural. We're not talking about you sitting up uh, afraid of anybody. That's demonic. Perfect love casts out all fears. You're grown women. You're grown men. Are you with me? We're talking about you maturing in spiritual things. When we talk about spiritual sons and spiritual daughters, we are not talking about somebody making decisions for you. We are talking about levels of submission so that levels of authority can be released to you. And it's an attitude. Are you with me? Yes. So, uh, you know, when it comes to your stages, there's levels of authority. And then write this down. Each level has specific characteristics. And then each stage has a rite of passage. So if you're in stage one, You've got to figure out what is the rite of passage. For instance, when it comes to driving, first you get your uh, uh, restricts, your permit and your restricts. That's when you're young. And then when you get a certain age, you get your driver's license. But there's a rite of passage first. The first rite of passage is you've got to get someone to teach you how to drive. You got to get what? Driver's instruction. You, you just can't put a three-year-old and say, you're old enough, drive yourself to preschool. <laughs> drive yourself to day school. Are you with me? They, they, they've got to mature. Their legs have to grow. Their hands, they got to have hand-eye coordination. You know that if a three-year-old can hold a milk bottle, can you imagine what they're going to do with your car? Let's, let's name the car. Can you imagine what they'll do with your Lamborghini? Can you, can you imagine what they're going to do with your bands? I was just prophesying your Lamborghini was coming. I was just prophesying. <laughs> I mean, you should have said amen right there. Everybody was looking like, I don't have a Lamborghini. That was prophetic. <laughs> I'm trying to build capacity for Lamborghini. Are you with me? I know you got a Toyota. That's a good car. But you're going to the next level. (laughs) Each day has a rite of passage. So how do I know when God is promoting me? How do I know when I'm qualified? And we're going to teach you about the rites of passage. We're going to teach you about the stages, the level of authority, and your rite of passage. And then each of those levels, again, has characteristics. Each stage has a rite of passage. So let's look at the eight stages of spiritual maturation. Let's list them first. And then today we're going to talk about the first stage. So the first stage is the gester, gester. Out of which the English word gestation. So you know we're talking about womb. And I want to recommend, highly recommend each one of you to get push. Because in the book Push, you're giving all the wombs of the spirit. Write this down. There are 26 wombs of the spirit. And so it's possible that you might not be under a demonic attack. You might be having spiritual contractions. Heaven might be birthing you out into a new realm. Whenever a baby is being birthed out, there's always going to be what? Contractions and what? Travailing and what else? There's always going, there's also going to be deliverance. As you mature in the things of the Lord, you've got to stop associating all deliverance with demons. When a baby is being delivered, it means that they're moving from one realm into another realm. It means that the realm that they're being delivered from is restricting their growth. It means that they cannot grow anymore. So when we have deliverance services, it doesn't mean that you're full of demons. It might mean that what God is doing 
is pushing you into another realm. Are you with me? And so when we feel that push, some of us want to push back because it almost feels as if the devil is attacking us when in fact it may not be a demon. So what we need is spiritual practitioners and midwives that are trained in heaven's sonogram. Because we need people who are trained with spiritual, the spiritual technology of a sonogram. So when you take a sonogram, what happens? They tell you you're pregnant. They tell you, you know, it's a male or a female. And you know, it's a boy, a girl. It weighs so much. Those sonograms are amazing. Are you with me? They got 3D sonograms now. Before you had to wait to figure out what, what the child was going to be. Uh, you know, back in the day, you know, all we know is you're getting larger and larger. Are you with me? Is it a boy? I don't know. It's hanging low. It looks like it's a boy. The old. <laughs> And then a girl comes out because we, did, we, we didn't have that technology back then. Are you with me? We are growing in the things of the Lord and he is establishing us in present truth. And God is raising up accurate prophets. You don't need a prophet to prophesy a car. You can prophesy your own car. Amen. I don't need a prophet to tell me your name. I see, I see, I see, I see. Uh, uh, God is speaking to me. Your name is Cindy. I could have told you. <laughs> you don't have to go that high. I could have just gave, given you my name. I'm not impressed. <laughs> tell me something I don't know. <laughs> you see, you, when you are matured, when you begin to mature spiritually, you know there's a difference between the word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, and prophecy. Yeah. And most of what we have today are not prophets. We have people that are highly functioning in a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge. Amen. 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 A prophet speaks uh, to the future. Tell me what God is going to do. Give me a prophecy at least for the next six months. Let me see if if, if it's going to come to pass. Because if the six months don't come to pass, I'm not going to trust you for the sixth year. (laughs) I don't even know why I said that (laughs) go to the word of God and prophesy the word of God in your own life are you with me and so there's the guest that's the womb a guester is the incubation stage number one Romans 8 19 to 23 you can write that down There's an attack on that stage when something or someone is being incubated. Usually there's going to be a spirit of abortion. Write that down. You see, the devil is not all knowing. So when you see an attack on a region like bombing and terrorist attack and ethnic cleansing, where you have a whole whole regions and whole countries that are being wiped out thousands of people losing their lives is because the devil knows that God is getting ready to birth someone out of that region. So because he don't know exactly who it is, he wants to wipe out the whole region. Where do we see that? We see it in in the book of of, of Exodus, where, where now the king rises up and says, just kill all the boy children. Because the, 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 the devil was picking up. The deliverer is getting ready to be, be, to be birthed from out of this generation. What do we call that? Satanic concentration. And it can happen on families. It can happen in regions. It can happen in ministries and churches. I've seen so many people's purpose being aborted by demonic spirits uh, where people are being moved from ministries. They're moving out too quick. They believe, well, I'm not getting noticed. No. You know, Come as, as, as uh, when the Lord was maturing me, it's interesting because uh, th- th- those of us that have more to lose are the ones that get the most attacked. Yeah. And what the enemy wants to do is to move you out of place. I'm not talking about a physical place. I'm talking about a spiritual place. 
Because if he can move you from under covering, he can attack you. You see, the reason why you stay under covering is because the enemy will have to kill your your, your covering before he can ever touch you. So you see a lot of people just jumping from church to church because things get hard. The devil could go to hell. Are you with me? He's on his way anyway. Never allow the enemy to move you out of place. Never stop talking about who don't like you in church. You are not there to be liked. You're there to mature. God gives you a pastor after his heart, not after yours. My spiritual father was probably one of the wisest men. And, you know, I was the one with the international ministry. I've been preaching since I was 18 years old. So I was the one with the international ministry. But he was so wise. He was used by God. And the the individuals that were preached once a year, twice a year, they were the ones that were being promoted. They were the ones that were being licensed. And I had to wait and wait and wait and wait. And then people start whispering in, in, in my ear. I don't think he likes you. And I said, if you say that one more time, I'm going to call your name and I'm going to tell him you said it. (laughs) Did they talk to me ever again? No. Why? Because you've got to be careful who controls your ear. Because oftentimes they don't know. They could be used by a spirit. And that spirit could be a spirit of abortion. Isn't that what happened to Peter? Where Jesus was saying, look, one day I'm going to die. I'm going to be crucified. And Jesus, uh, uh, Peter rebuked Jesus. And, and Jesus had to turn around. He said, you have no idea, Peter, what spirit just used you. One minute they get a revelation from God. The next minute they're listening to demons and their mouthpieces. You got to discern the spirit that's driving people. If a person can't hear from God for themselves, they can't hear from God for you. Your life ain't together. I don't give you permission to speak into my life. Why? Because then you will get the bad end of the stick. The spirit of abortion will attack this stage. And you'll never get out of incubation period. God incubated me. Why? Because he was testing my motive. Motive is something that you can't see. It's there in the realm of the spirit. He was testing. Let me see what she's going to do when nobody acknowledges her ministry. Let me see if she's driven by the applause of man. Let me see what happens when she's disappointed. Let me test. Let me see what comes out of her. Let me see how she's going to serve. Is she still going to serve if she's not promoted? Is she going to be faithful to the assignment I gave her? You see, somebody may be used by God to give you an assignment, but it's God that gives you the assignment. Let's let's see whether or not she's going to serve with excellence. Let's see whether she's going to grumble, whether she's going to complain. Let's see how she's going to deal with the level of respect that she has for authority. Because the same way you treat authority when you're following is how people are going to treat you when you're in a place of authority. You don't attract who you want. You attract who you are. People will be submitted to you when you're submitted to someone else. And a lot of people think that it's all control. It has nothing to do with control. I don't control people. I'm not into scare tactics. Are you with me? My staff better not be afraid of me. I I need them to respect me, but not fear me. Fear God. Why? My job is to point you to God. And if you, and let me tell you something, if you are not submitted to God, you can be submitted to me. Are you with me? And so a lot of people are aborted while they're being incubated and matured. Abortion is a time where nobody sees you. I've never seen a baby that's three months stick their head out and say, hey world, I'm in here. I just want you to know, my mama's got me in an pu- uh, incubation. She's not the only one that has a personality. I got a personality too. 
I got a purpose too. I got a ministry too. I got lungs too. I got eyes too. I got the anointing too. They stay in that place of incubation until the timing of the Lord. When you think it's timing for you, it may not be. So where I was, I was already preaching at 18. I was already, already running. My first message I preached to, uh, I think it was a woman's meeting or a youth mini, mini, mi, meeting or something. The second message, I did a three-day revival. Third message, I did a two-week revival. I still can't believe they were listening to me. It was my only <laughs> third time preaching. <laughs> the third time I preached, I was international. My third sermon, I was international. That was my third sermon. So what did the Lord test me? With humility. Yes. You're traveling around the world, but I want to see how humble you are. I want to see if your ego is attached to the assignment. So he tested all areas and he used this amazing leader. He was an amazing leader with an apostolic. And he was the only one that, that, that could cover me because he was strong. I needed someone stronger than me. I'm a born leader. I can lead from the back, from the middle, from the front. I'm just a born leader. Are you with me? I don't ask permission. I just lead. I come in. I, I, listen, I'm a problem solver. So I walk in and I can see the solution to everything. Your life, your business, I, 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 that's just my gift. I'm good. Don't ask me to sing because I can sing. I'm good at what I'm anointed to do. Are you with me? I'm not good at what I'm not anointed to do. Now, I'm not anointed to sing, even though I sound like Beyonce and Rihanna and, and, and uh, Celine Dion and, and all together. If you mix them all together, that's what I sound like <laughs> to me. But nobody gave me a record deal. I'm the only one that thinks that. I'm not good at that, but I'm very strong. I have a strong presence. I have a commending presence. So what did God do? He incubated me to refine that so that when I got on a larger, larger platform, I wasn't all over the place. Right, right. So he disciplined me so that I wasn't all over the place. And he used it when he hid me yeah. in obscurity. So I traveled all over the world. When I came home, I had to learn how to sit myself down and wait until what? I was promoted, wait until I was licensed, then wait until I was ordained. And that was years behind my colleagues. Are you following me? You see, sometimes you may be the best singer, you may be the best psalmist, but you never get the lead. God is hiding you and incubating you and testing your spirit, testing your maturity, testing you, trying to figure out why do you want to do this? Can I trust you with the anointing? Can I trust you with people's lives? Are you going to mess up? He's looking, he's looking at your character. Gifts will carry you to places. Character will keep you there. You want staying power. Are you with me? You don't want to get there and then the enemy said, oh, I've been waiting so that, so that when I bring you down, the whole world knows. Because when the enemy attacks, he's not going to attack privately. He's going to attack you publicly. So God, what God does is hide you, incubate you, put you in, in a spiritual womb so that you can grow in every area and then he introduces you. The attack is always going to be abort, uh, an abortion. We abort, we self-sabotage. And people that are, are less talented, less anointed, less skilled, ends up replacing us. And so this is the story of Saul, isn't it? You know, he's promoted. He's now a leader. He's one of the greatest leaders. He could have been the, one of the greatest leaders Israel ever had. He's the first king that Israel has. And then he is tested. Samuel says, I just need to incubate you. Do not sacrifice anything until I get there. Just testing him. 
testing him to see if he's going to submit. Well, I'm the king. I got the crown. And so he moved out of covering and he ended up losing spiritually. Just because you're still functioning and you still have a title in the natural doesn't mean that you haven't been fired spiritually. People may recognize you, but does heaven recognize you? This is very important. So you, you want to you wanna be submitted to God, what he's doing in your life, and God knows what's best. And when it comes to a pastor, God gives you a pastor after his heart, not yours. So because I grew up in a single parent home, I didn't know anything about submitting to anybody, let alone, you know, somebody spiritual. And I was so used to doing my own thing. I was independent. I started my business when I was eight. I was financially responsible for myself at 12. I was paying bills at 16. Are you with me? So, so now at 17, when I get saved and 18, and I'm trying to understand this, you know, the spirit realm and the Pentecostal church, and I'm trying to understand all of this stuff. And because I, 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 I'm a, I, I think intellectually, so half of the stuff didn't make any sense. <laughs> Are you with me? One and one don't make two. It makes, it makes you know, 11. <laughs> so it didn't, you know, and, 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 and I was like, you know, why are these people crying? And why they got to ask permission? I'm not asking anybody permission. <laughs> I had to pay my own bills. Are you with me? And then because I didn't have a male in my house, I didn't understand that submissive stuff. So I wasn't afraid of anybody. Because I never got the memo. I never got the email. I never got the tweet. <laughs> Thou shalt be afraid. So I didn't grow up in a religious setting. So I grew up. My mother provided a very stable home and taught us morality and ethics and, and character. So I knew how to conduct myself because that's how we were trained. But I, 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 I didn't have to ask permission. We didn't have any money in the house, and I wanted to go ballet. My mother never said no. It just was no money. So if you want to go ballet, guess what? You got to create your own wealth. So I started creating wealth at eight. You got to understand. Are you with me? I'm wired just a little different. And so now I joined the church. I'm talking about spiritual maturation here. I joined the church. I got to learn how to submit. So, you know, everybody else was nervous. I didn't know I should be nervous. <laughs> Are you with me? So I'm not getting this. And plus, you know, I'm excited. I'm just a positive person. I think I could do everything. Are you with me? So I'm coming in and people are waiting for permission. I'm gone. (laughs) And they're like, slow down. And I'm an ideas generator. I think very quickly. So I have to slow down with my staff. I have to let them generate ideas. Because I could solve problems just like this. Plus, I get bored fast. (laughs) <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? So just hurry up. Hurry up with the conversation. Are you with me? Can you help me? Yes. So after five minutes, I got it. But you want to talk 50 minutes, not with me. Five minutes, I got it. I'll give you 10 minutes, then we're going to solve problems. Because you already told the story. You told it to your uncle, your auntie, your, you know, you told it to your friend. Everybody knows the story. You don't, you don't need, you know, you, you, I'm, the, I'm the problem solver. So I get it after a couple of minutes, boom. Are you with me? I'm quick. I'm very quick. But I couldn't be quick because a ministry moves at the pace of the slowest member. So, you know, I mature very, very fast. I understand very quickly. So I'm wondering, why, why, why everybody dragging? I'm gone. And then I forgot to ask permission. So now I'm in trouble. <laughs> So I get told off, and I'm like, cool. And then I get told off publicly. I never left. Why? Because it ain't, it ain't personal. Right. And I'm leading and creating and doing some amazing things. But I still get told off publicly. Never once was I embarrassed. Why? Because I never got the memo to be embarrassed. <laughs> I didn't know I should be embarrassed. So now here's this young girl, strong, with, you know, a great man of God that's very strong. He's very strong. And the whole church is shaking. I'm the, not, the only one not shaking, so I'm sticking out. Like, why are you not shaking? I don't know. I should stay, shake. <laughs> well, I'm going to break you. 
With all due respect, you break horses, dogs, cows, or your daughter, but you're not gonna break me, sir. Because you gotta respect, right, sir? <laughs> Who are you? I came just to help hold up your arms. I got capacity for you. I'm young, I'm a female, but I got capacity. Can you imagine sticking out and the enemy wanting to abort that? You wouldn't have known me. Uh, there wouldn't have been no commanding your morning, rules of engagement, push. There would not have been if I had aborted the process. It wasn't about me, it was about all the people that I was called to touch. Amen. So in submitting, I remember the day he said, I'm going to break you. And I said, you break cows and horses and your daughter, you ain't breaking me, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I was never afraid. But I remember that day, years later, I remember that day when I was broken and the enemy came in. I'm talking about abortion, spiritual abortion here. The enemy came in and said, leave. You don't have to take this. You got to understand me. You understand me as a businesswoman, understand me as a preacher. I'm not somebody that you play with, honestly. You can't play with me. I'm the nicest person and I smile, but I'm not someone that you play with. Because as quick as I can smile, I could wipe the smile off of your face. <laughs> as quick. And so that was always inside of me. And that's what God was trying to get to. Are you with me? Oh, yes. While I'm smiling, I could just decapitate you one time. And you're smiling and your head is rolling like, did she just decapitate me? <laughs> With a smile. God had to get to that. He had to get to the independent spirit. He had to get, and it was deep down there. And he did it all in incubation. So that when I was on a public platform, are you with me? Yes. With the world watching, the enemy would have no place in me. Self doesn't give up self. It protects self. This is why you make excuses. When you're found out, you ever notice? You make excuses, you pro pro project. That's what God is trying to get to. So that part of you can die. The, and so that the God nature can live. Are you following me? So he'll incubate you. The second stage is tikto. That's the birthing, that's the shortest part. That's when you're birthed out, you've been delivered, and then that's the time for bonding. And what the enemy will fight, he will fight you bonding. So what he would do is he would allow in the early stages of your life abandonment so that you carry a spirit of an orphan. There's a book that I wrote, um, Overcoming Your Past, where I deal with the spirit of the orphan in there. Write that down. The spirit, just get the book. It's good for you. That's what, that's, what, that's what God had to deliver me from, the spirit of an orphan. It means that you don't really bond with anybody. You control, you control how far a person gets. So, you know, they let you in, but you don't let them in. And then, you know, you're going to leave before they hurt, all of that stuff. You got you to read the spirit of, 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 of an orphan. It's interesting. And there's so many people who are orphans. Now, I, I'm, I'm twice an orphan in the natural as well as the spiritual. Are you with me? So being twice an orphan being abandoned twice. So God had to deliver me from the spirit of an orphan. I know about it because I had to be delivered from it. Now, that means that with, if you have the spirit of an orphan, it means that when God begins to deliver you and connect you, you don't bond. There's no bonding. And so we have to be careful there because what God is going to do is break the spirit of abandonment and the spirit of an orphan. And there are so many people in church that have been abandoned and orphaned in the natural. So it translates spiritually. So you, you can never have authentic relationships. So you, you get close enough to benefit, but not close enough to be changed because you don't trust. You see, trusting is you not trusting a person with your heart. So there are people who are married whose husband don't even know them because they're never, they're not, never gonna trust. And just because you grew up with both parents doesn't mean that you haven't suffered from abandonment because it's possible for your father to be present uh, physically but not emotionally. 
It's possible for a, your mother to be present physically, but not emotionally. Are you with me? And so it translates spiritually. You don't bond. You don't bond with your leader. You don't bond with members of the church. There are so many people suffering from abandonment and the spirit of an orphan. So that's that stage, Tikto, is to break that spirit so that you can now connect to the body of Christ and become a part of a community. Number three, Padion, that's zero to two. That's your toddler stage. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get deeper into the message. Then there is Napias. Napias, that's the fourth stage. That stage is interesting because what the enemy will do at that stage, you might get to the fourth stage, but you might have arrested development. So have you ever been with a person that's 40, 50, 60, 70, and they act like they're 16? They act like they're eight emotionally? So it's possible for you to be uh, matured uh, spiritually, but very immature uh, emotionally. You might be an emotional handicap. Will you, will, you, will you have grown women crying because someone said something about them? You know, or they're depressed because someone, you know, I, I see it all the time where you go into church and people say, well, that person doesn't like me. How you know they don't like you? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I walked in church. They didn't even speak to me. Did you realize that last night she lost her father and she was depressed? She didn't notice anybody. So it's not always about you. Sometimes people are going through things and people leave church for, for these reasons because of arrested development. The next one is Pais, P-A-I-S-E. That's the stage number five. The attack on this stage is always spiritual wondering. So you're mature, but you're not mature enough. And then you start wondering. You, go, you, you know, I, I, I've never seen it like this before in Christianity, where people are just wondrous. They have no roots. They let anybody feed them. <laughs> they don't discern anything. Anybody could say anything. Anybody has a dream. Anybody has a vision. They're not discerning. They're just wandering all over the place. Turn to your neighbor and say, stop wandering. Stop wandering. Put, put roots down somewhere. <laughs> a rolling stone gathers no moss. The next one, stage number six, is Technon. And we're going to give you scriptures for all of this. Technon. That's stage number six. The attack on that stage is rebellion. So it's not a stage of immaturity. So you, the prodigal son was not rebellious. He was immature, right? Because his father allowed him to go. So you don't see him leaving without his father's blessing. His father said, go ahead, take this with you. Because he, he, his father wanted him, this to be a defining moment, a learning point, where he, he, he was sure, this is what I want to do. I, I, I want my inheritance in my father's house and, you know, I acknowledge that this is my destiny. So his father gave him permission to do, th to do that. And then stage number seven is we us. Within that stage is two. There's the we us and then there's we us thesis. And then the last stage is mater pater, where you become a mother or father. And so when we deal with spiritual maturations, again, each stage has a rite of passage, has a level of authority has specific characteristics. And so for, for, for the next final few minutes, just the final few minutes, I wanna, I wanna talk to you about Gester. And I'm only gonna take a few minutes with that and then we'll continue on in the, the, the next uh, portion of this message. The Gester stage, write this down, stage number one, stage number one. Genesis 49, 25 says this, by the God of your fathers who will help you and by the almighty who will bless you with the blessings of heaven above, the blessings of the deep that lies beneath, the blessings of the breast and of the womb. So we know that God is interested in the womb. The womb is a familiar concept to humankind, especially to women. Amongst the obvious, a physical difference between a man and a woman is her womb. But the male is, is not exempt when it comes to having a womb as well. Albeit it is not physical, but it's spiritual. So there's 26 wombs of the spirit, write it down. 
And again, you can find all the wombs in the book called Push. So the concept of the womb is developed. It's developed from Genesis to Revelation, from the birth of humanity, from the mind of God to the new heaven and the new earth in Revelation. So the first mandate given to man was to be fruitful. So fruitful, fruitfulness uh, presupposes that God has given you seed, right? So he didn't say be seedful. He said be fruitful. That means that you're going to have seed. So, so when we talk about seed, the, the image that God gave me was the image of a pomegranate. A pomegranate has um, 613 seeds, and there are 613 laws that God gave to his people in the Old Testament. So that means that for, 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 to be fruitful, all those laws are going to operate. So there are laws of the spirit that we need to understand. How do we function in this world? And a lot of people are not as fruitful because they're breaking spiritual laws out of ignorance. Yeah. They're not breaking spiritual laws out of rebellion. They're breaking spiritual laws out of immaturity and ignorance. So what God is going to do, he's going to begin to incubate us again. We're, he's going to take us back into a place where we are growing and maturing because of things like prayer and fasting and Bible study and devotions. You know, my question is, how many of you woke up this morning and you had devotions? You prayed at least for 15 minutes and you had your personal devotion at least for 15 minutes. How many of you really desire the wisdom of God? You really desire hearing from God. And, and sometimes God will have you in a spiritual incubation where it's just you and him, where, where there's nobody else but you and him. And he begins to speak to you about the word of God, about your purpose, about your destiny, about your assignment and what he had for you. And many of us are so distracted in this world with cell phones and Twitters. And, you know, a lot of people live by their cell phone. As soon as that notification goes off, they, they pick it up. <laughs> what, about pick, what about picking up your Bible? When the Holy Spirit notifies you, it's time to read. Amen. It's time to pray. Amen. How many of you are so uh, in tune with heaven that you pick up the notification? Are you with me? Yeah. So... So that, that womb is, 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 is a part of, 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 of the maturation process. This is a season that God is going to begin to do some amazing things. I, I read that the word pomegranate means to rise up or rising up. Isn't, isn't that interesting? Rising up. You remember the woman with the issue of blood touching the hem of, his, of Jesus' garment? So the hem of the priest's garment had boughs and had gold around it, but it also had pomegranates. Wow. So that means that she was what? Barren. So when she touched the hem of his garment, the pomegranate was symbolic of the fruitfulness that God was going to give her. Not only that, she was bent over. And the word pomegranate means what? Rising up. This is your season for rising up. Wow for growing into everything predestinated for you. God is about to reveal his glory to this generation. The pain and the discomfort that you are experiencing may not be because of a demonic attack. You may be in the throes of divine contractions. You, you may be growing in the things of the Lord so much, but it's incubated. You, nobody else knows it but you and God. You, you've been fasting, you've been praying, you've been hidden in the incubation. You know God has a great work for you to do. You know you're anointed, you know you have purpose, but nobody notices it. Could it be that he's just incubating you and hiding you and developing you in the things of the spirit? Stop blaming people, stop blaming your boss. You might be in the guester stage. You people may know who you are in the church, but they may not know you in the industry. Right, right, right. So spiritual, spiritually you're matured, but in your industry, professionally, you might be incubated. God still might be developing you. Are you seeing this? Yes. So you could, be, you could have a good time in church, but a hard time in the workplace. Wow. It may not be a demon. 
You may be incubated and God developing you so that eventually he makes you the head of your discipline or profession or your career. And maybe something that God does. Just a few more points and then we're going to close in prayer. The Bible says in Genesis uh, 49, 25, that he's going to bless the womb, the blessings of the breast and the blessings of the womb. So gaster out of which we get the English word gestation. So the gaster stage begins with conceptualization. Someone has to conceive something. So conceive. Sieve in a word means seed. Con seed. Con means to take in and hold to. Conceive. So those of you that are married, the single people don't know nothing about this, especially if you're born again and saved, amen, and filled up with the Holy Ghost. Right. But a husband and wife during uh, acts of intimacy and intense fellowship, a, a, a man releases a lot of seed, but it, it's based on a specific time frame that the woman can hold on to the seed. Are you with me? She not only takes it in, but she holds on to it until she what? Conceives. And so the jester or the gester stage is a stage of conception. Where, 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 how does that look like in the realm of the spirit? God can give you a prophetic word. He could give you prophetic prompting, prophetic insight concerning something that he wants to do for you in the future. Now, you're going to hold on to that seed by faith. And, and you're going to watch that seed grow. But there are some people who have come to a point where they've been so disappointed with so many prophetic words, now they don't believe any prophetic word. They, they, they don't believe that's ever going to happen now because they were disappointed. They waited and waited. It's, oh, it's almost like, like, like Sarah. You know, when the, pro when, when, when the angel prophesied, Sarah, next year about this time, you're going to have a baby. She laughed like, what? <laughs> Don't play games with me. Yeah. Why? Because during the time when I was most fertile, I took seed in, but I couldn't hold on to the seed. I never conceived. Are you getting this? Wow. There are some people that are here that are listening to this message and God is speaking to you and telling you, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. But you can't conceive how he's going to do it. Wow. So what do you do? Spontaneous abortion. You've been disappointed. You've been, you know, for so long. So you can't conceive how he's going to do it. So you just discard it. It's almost like growing up and people promising you. And they didn't do it the first time. They didn't do it the second time. Now when people make promises to you, you don't believe anything anyone is saying. So because it happened in the natural, can you imagine when God speaks to you? Now, let me use myself as an example. So, you know, my father didn't come around very often. So I didn't really get a chance to recognize uh, who he was and what he looked like. I used to mix, mix him up with someone else. That's how infrequent my father came. So I, I couldn't even recognize his face. Can you imagine growing up like that? My, we used to walk in town and I used to wave at this man, say, hi, daddy. And my brothers and sisters used to say, that is not your father. <laughs> I, I used to miss him, mix him up with this other man. I didn't know. Are you with me? Turn to your name and say, dang, your daddy. God is your heavenly father. So he came in frequently. So he would keep promising, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, right? And he never came. Oh, I'm going to buy you skates. He never bought them. I'm going to buy you this. He never bought it. I'm going to give you money to go to university. He never did. So imagine me getting saved. And now my heavenly father says, I'm going to give you this and that and the other. Guess what I did? That's okay. Why? Just give me the strength so that I can work and I can pay my own bills. I've been paying my way all my life. All my life I had to fight. <laughs> so imagine God making these promises 
and me not being able to what? Conceive. I took it in, but I couldn't hold on to it. I couldn't wrap my mind around it. I couldn't wrap my spirit around it because I didn't want to be disappointed. And there are so many people in the body of Christ where God is making promises and we're like, that's okay. Why? Because we don't want to be disappointed ever again. Don't play with me. Don't mess with my mind. And so now when you're preaching, people have become what? Indifferent. So God had to do what? Deliver me from the spirit of indifference. Indifferent means I don't care if it happens. I don't care if it doesn't. All I know is I'm not going to be emotionally attached because I don't need to be disappointed again. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Raise both of your hands. I decree and declare God is delivering you from the spirit of indifference. I decree you do do care because now people say, I don't care. I don't care. I decree you're getting the ability to feel again and care again and believe again. God is delivering you from the spirit of indifference. God is not a man that he should lie. Your father may have promised and never made good, but God is going to make good on every promise. You are delivered right now. The guester stage. Conceive. Can you conceive yourself healed? Can you conceive yourself delivered? Can you conceive yourself? The thing about it is this, that all the odds were stacked up against Sarah. When the word of the Lord came in Genesis 18, 9 to 15, the word came and she laughed at it because she was afraid. She was afraid that another season will come by and she would take in the seed, but she wasn't going to be able to hold the seed. So she stopped believing. She was unable to conceive how God was going to bring his word to pass when all the odds were stacked up against her. And I want to prophesy right now, no matter how the odds are stacked up against you, you're going to prevail. You're going to conceive. I decree that Every spiritual prophetic seed that was released by way of a word that God gave to you, I decree that this is a season that you're going to hold on to it. No more abortion. I decree that you are not going to let the devil abort it. I decree your enemies will not abort it. Depression will not abort it. Poverty will not abort it. Discouragement will not abort it. Lack of support will not abort it. Up until this point she could not conceive but God made it possible because it was mind over matter. Her spirit man was able to receive it. Why? Because God captured her ear. Her ear is a part of the reproductive organ up until this point a spirit of abortion spoke. You're never going to be pregnant. This is never going to happen. Don't believe the word of a God. But one day God got her attention. I decree that God is getting your attention. The enemy doesn't want you to conceptualize your purpose, your future, your assignment, your worth, your dignity, your value, your power, your anointing, your gifts, your destiny. But I decree and declare today you are being healed and delivered from the spirit of abortion. I decree and declare that whatever God has put in your spirit, you are going to carry it full term. I decree you are not going to give up. God gave you a word about your son. He gave you a word about your daughter. He gave you a word about your family. He gave you a word about your healing. And I decree and declare no more abortion. I decree that through prayer, you are going to deliver everything. And if God could deliver Sarah from the spirit of barrenness, I decree and declare he's going to deliver your mother from cancer. He's going to deliver your father from alcoholism. He's going to deliver your brother from drugs. He's going to deliver your son from prison. He's going to deliver your uncle from stealing. He's going to deliver your auntie from lying. He's going to deliver your cousin from prostitution. He's going to deliver your co-worker from sabotage. He's going to deliver gangbangers from the corner. He's going to go 
and deliver criminals out of jail. The prostitute is going to be delivered. I decree your faith will not be shaken. They are hidden in a womb and they're waiting for someone to give birth. They're waiting for a midwife. I decree your midwife is coming. I decree people will no longer be used as an abortionist. I decree people are coming to speak to what you are carrying. I decree they're coming to help you to push. I decree you are going to conceive. I decree the spirit spirit of barrenness is broken. You're going to produce. You're going to produce. You're going to produce. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to pray. The guester stage is the stage of a womb. You know, the enemy wants to abort what you're carrying, what you're pregnant with. Back in the day, I had books that needed to be birthed out, businesses to be birthed out. And what the enemy wanted to do, he wanted to create a scenario where I voluntarily would give up on my future, my destiny. Because coming out of poverty and coming out of the struggle, then I couldn't conceive how God was going to do it. I told you already, there are some things that... God will allow you to understand. He'll give you comprehension. But most things is about cooperation. The prophetic words that was given when I was 17 and 18 and 19, where I couldn't see how God was going to do it, they are actually being manifested even now. If I had not stayed the course, if I had aborted it because of the pressure that that it took to make me into the person. I wouldn't be standing here today. Either the enemy wants to abort what you're carrying or he wants to abort you. Satanic concentration is real. It could be over a region, over a business, over a ministry. It could be over a family. The devil is not all knowing. Could it be that God has you incubated? And the enemy wants to abort you. A seed has to go into a a place of darkness and it has to be hidden. And then it takes pressure. And then when it's time for gestation or the guester stage, there's going to be a season of incubation where it has to grow. And while it's in the womb or while you're in the womb, You know when it's time to be birthed out into another, when you can't grow anymore, and when there's a restriction. And this is what happened to Jacob. When he goes into a place, the Bible, Isaac, and Isaac goes into Egypt, he plants a seed. The Bible said that God caused him to grow and he became very rich. But then the whole nation rejected him. Why? Because he had outgrown that realm and God was birthing him into a new realm of prosperity. And he would have stayed there with a lid on him until the contractions happened. The Bible said he went from one well to another. They named the well Ezekiel. There's a lot of wells. One means contention. One means antagonism. One means strife. The antagonism, the strife, and all of that that you're undergoing creates great emotional pain but I want you to hold fast, hold fast in prayer. Why? It may not be a demonic attack. Heaven just might be having contractions and getting ready to birth you out. The guester stage, you can read more about it in PUSH. We're gonna encourage each one of you to pick up a copy of PUSH and begin to look at the 26 wombs of the spirit. Either you're incubating something or you're being incubated. It's the story of Elijah, isn't it? He's incubated. Nobody knows that he's going to be the next prophet to take over the university, to become the provost of this university. Nobody knows that he's going to be the next great. Because why? 
he was incubated as a minister of helps or helps minister. He was serving, but he stayed submitted in this womb. And when Israel needed the next prophet, God goes into the womb and bam, the contractions happen. He loses his, his, his father, his spiritual father, and in the thoroughs of the greatest amount of emotional pain and loss, God burps him out as one of the greatest prophets, amongst the greatest prophets that Israel had ever seen. Don't allow the enemy to cause you to abort what God is doing in your life. Abort it spiritually, emotionally, naturally. Hold fast. To everything, there's a time, to, there's a season and a time and purpose for everything under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. There's a birth date and an expiration date for everything. But if something expires, if something dies, it means something else is going to be born. Some of you are coming to the ending of a season. It could be an emotional season, financial season, a spiritual season. You're coming to the ending of that season. It's not in all areas of your life. Don't catastrophize a moment. Don't say everything is going wrong when it's not. It may, you may be challenged financially, but spiritually everything is fine. Are you with me? So f when you go home and pray, just ask God, what er area am I in uh, incubation stage? And I want to practicalize this very much. When you, you go to church, you got, you know, the newborn babes, and they're crying, wah, wah, and you give them milk. And then you hear, rawr, rawr, where's my Coke? You know, and you look in the incubation and you got a grown man with hairy legs hanging out of the incubator. You know, the, the, the babies are in the incubator. <laughs> and then you got a grown man and he's crying and you need to shave him because his bro beard is grown. And it's still in the incubation. Are you with me? You don't want to be in an incubator when you should be birthed out. You can imagine little babies in the hospital and they, they weigh four pounds, five pounds, six pounds, and then you weigh 158 pounds and you're still in the incubator. <laughs> they had to build a one especially for you. We want, we want God to begin to birth it out. Don't fight the discomfort. The discomfort just might mean that God is taking you to the next level. Amen? Amen. Did you get anything out of this? Yes. Well, let's pray. Our Father, our God, we thank you even as we work through each one of the stages. We pray that you would speak to our heart, that you would give us an understanding of where we are in, in, in all areas of our lives. We live in 12 different dimensions. It's possible to be matured in two, to be on stage uh, one, in three, to be in stage four, in another one. We could be in different stages. We want every area of our lives to be mature. Yes. And so, Father, today we are cooperating. Yes. We're cooperating with the Holy Spirit and what he's doing in our lives. 